going to record this. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, this February Lehigh Valley ACS section webinar and, and section meeting. And uh, we do have a distinguished speaker tonight, history of, uh, of chemistry. And I'm going to let uh, Roger Egolf, uh, our uh, host for this evening, uh, introduce our speaker. Roger. Yes. Um... Well, I have the pleasure of introducing David Lewis from the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, um, a good friend of mine from the History of Chemistry Division. And I've noticed we have a lot of other attendees from HIST tonight. Uh, many of them, uh, the Lehigh Valley people know. Uh, but uh, I'm not introducing them right now. I'm introducing David. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, David came to the United States from Australia uh, quite a while ago, back in 1976, uh, after doing his PhD in Australia, um, and um, spent some time at the University of Arkansas, uh, Baylor, South Dakota State, and since 1997, he has been at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, Dave is a very uh, active uh, organic researcher with uh, over uh, 100 journals and articles. Um, he's written an advanced textbook uh, and does a lot of work in the history of chemistry also, especially the uh, stories of dead Russians. And that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, Markovnikov and Zaitev, uh, names that uh, all of us know, and uh, but not all of us know that uh, they knew each other well and uh, didn't really enjoy knowing each other that well. Uh, so... Take it away, David. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, I guess we'll start by sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad. Whoa, where's my. All right. Somewhere. That's the one I want. Okay, now we go and. Where do I get the. Let's go with more, and does it... No, that's not what I want. Up to slideshow you want to do. Yeah. Top. At least that's what I see up... up uh... Yeah, but I'm... Uh, let me... Let me stop sharing for a minute. And I will get this rolling as a proper presentation. Okay, that's good. And now... Uh, it's not going to let me, is it? All right, we'll end the show and we'll do it this way. Get rid of that. And then uh, huh. now let's try this. Well, does this work for you folks? Yeah, see yeah. the title. So well, you, you should be able to go up to slideshow at the top and click on that, and it oh. should. Uh, oh, yeah, up there. I thought of that. Thank you, mate. Uh, yeah, play from current slide. Yes, yeah. not that. We start. Yeah. Right. There we are. And now, so let's talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Roger. I did take your. Uh, uh, Russian transliteration, which was a little weird. <laughs> I've given you here the real Russian instead. <laughs> you didn't like my Cyrillic, huh? Как сказать? Нет. So anyway, we're going to talk about a hatred that uh, still haunts undergraduate organic chemistry 150 years later. Now, uh, it's unusual, but I want to start this particular presentation off with a dedication to a very good friend of mine who just passed away on Christmas Day. This is Vladimir Ivanich Galkin. He was the head of the Butlerov Institute of Chemistry at Kazan Federal University. And we would always greet each other as Moi Brat, my brother. Um, and in fact, the time when I broke my rib, 
Um, the next time I saw him, he says, you know, you broke your rib. We are really brothers now because next I broke my hand. <laughs> uh, soulmates. <coughs> Vladimir was a big teddy bear and a wonderful man and a good chemist to boot. So now, you may not realize how many Russians there are in your undergraduate textbooks. Baradin, yes, the composer, Alexander Porfirich Baradin, discovered the Aldol addition reaction. Mendeleev, everybody knows, you know, he gave rise to the ACS uh, member get a member blanket. <coughs> um, Fyodor Fyodorovich Balstein, Friedrich Conrad, gave us Balstein's uh, uh, handbook, Der Organischen Chemie, but he also gave us the Balstein test for halogens and um, he did uh, work on the chlorination of toluene and benzyl halides and came up with conditions that would allow you to do the reaction under free radical or ionic conditions. Nikolai Menshutkin, the first editor of the uh, uh, Journal of the Russian Physical Chemical Society, uh, also gave us the Menshutkin reaction, which is an SN2 reaction that we still use to teach sophomores. Zelinsky, Nikolai Dmitrich Zelinsky, is the Zelinsky of the Hell Volhart Zelinsky alpha halogenation, alpha bromination of carboxylic acids. And then the young man on the bottom right there is Nikolai Medvedevich Kishner. And Kishner, of course, is the Kishner of the Wolf Kishner reduction. Now, most of you are probably familiar with, oh, let's see. St. Petersburg, Moscow. But now I've got you folks. Ah, I can move your window out of the way. And here we have Kazan. Now Kazan is the Republic of Tatarstan's capital. Uh, it's the eighth biggest city in Russia. Um, it's a thousand years old. It celebrated its millennium in 2004 and there are Russians you've heard of who came from this place, like Tolstoy. Tolstoy studied law. Uh, he actually studied partying more uh, assiduously and consequently did not graduate. Vladimir Ulyanov was expelled. We know him better as Lenin. Uh, Nikolai Lobachevsky, say the name to your mathematician friends and they will recognize the father of non-Euclidean geometry. Mili Balakirov, the composer, but he began at Kazan as a student in mathematics. <coughs> and Yevgeny Zavoysky, who is the physicist who discovered EPR. Okay. And so here we have the cradle of Russian organic chemistry. This is Kazan University. The building actually looks pretty much the same today. It's a big building um, shaped like a capital E. The university was founded in 1804 by a degree of Tsar Alexander I. The locals didn't want it. There was not a strong educated middle class in the city and they didn't see there was any need for a university, but the Tsar told them, you're gonna have one. So they got it. The first, here we have the first Russian born rector of the uh, university. This is our friend, um, Nikolai Lobachevsky, the uh, non-Euclidean geometry mathematician. <coughs> now, what about chemists from Kazan? Well, if we take a look, we've got over here uh, in this corner, Karl Klaus, who discovered ruthenium. And he discovered it because the solution tasted weird, a solution platinum. We don't recommend that our students determine concentration or identity by taste anymore. Nikolai Zinian discovered how to reduce nitrobenzene to amyl and in the process basically built the German dye and pharmaceutical industries. Here we have Alexander Mikhailovich Butlerov, a genuine Renaissance man, and we will meet him uh, again a little later. But um, 
one of the things he came up with was the first ever synthesis of tertiary butyl alcohol, which he did by the reaction between dimethyl zinc, a poisonous pyrophoric liquid, and phosgene, a nasty blistering agent used as a chemical warfare agent in World War I. Here is Vladimir Vasilich Markovnikov himself as a young man. This was taken in 1871, uh, sorry, 1870. And here we have Alexander Mikhailich Zaitsev, our other protagonist. And this was taken in uh, 1870, this was the 1871 photograph. Now, both of these young men ended up as professors at Russian universities. The career path was sort of the same, but not the same. Um, the first stage was to graduate with your undergraduate degree, the diploma. And then if you showed promise, you were held back for further training. Uh, you would write what in this country today we would call a senior thesis uh, on a literature research project. And you'd present that for the degree of candidate. Now, today, the candidate is the full equivalent of a Western PhD. But the candidate would allow you to become a laborant, a paid laboratory assistant. <clears throat> Most students then, after the candidate, went on a commandirovka, or a paid study leave abroad. Now, what's very interesting is that Every time I give this talk in, or talk like this in Russia, and I talk about them having a komendirovka, they all laugh. Because in the 19th century, this was something that was going to last one to two years. And it was a full paid study leave abroad. Today, it's a business trip, sort of like a weekend in Vegas kind of deal. And so they think, oh, yeah, well, he took a weekend off. No, he spent two years. After you came back from your Komandirovka, the uh, norm was that you were either promoted to docent or you were already a docent. Another year of research and passing an examination and writing the dissertation, you got to the Master of Chemistry, the Magister Chimi. And this qualified you for promotion to extraordinary professor or associate professor. And then another couple of years, back in the 1870s at least, another couple of years qualified you for your doctor Hemi. Uh, this is about the equivalent of a modern habilitation in Europe. And this was the minimum uh, qualification required to permit you to become an ordinary professor. All right, next. Okay. Now, Nicholas I came to the throne at the end of the 19th century. Well, sorry, uh, early in the 19th century. His reign followed the Decemberist revolt, which means that Nicholas I had very little time for, oh, I don't know, let's say the lewd progressive ideas from Western Europe. And so he moved very quickly towards Russification of the professoriate. And the problem he faced immediately was there were no Russians who were actually qualified to be university professors. And so he had, it's, it's funny that his crackdown, his reaction and crackdown actually had the opposite effect because it opened up Western Europe to Russian chemistry students. And, you know, Zinian, Butlerov, Zaitsev, Markovnikov all studied in Western Europe to pick up uh, information and, and knowledge. Uh, popular destinations early on, you had Gettingen and Gießen. Gießen was a big draw with leaving. Uh, Paris with Charles Wurz, or with uh, Adolf Wurz, rather, uh, was another big one. Uh, Kolbe, attracted Russian students. He had a large contingent of Russian students most of his time. And then in Heidelberg, you had both Erlenmeyer and Kekulé. Markovnikov and Zaitsev both studied with Kolbe, and Zaitsev also spent a year in Wurtz Laboratory in Paris. So let's begin with Vladimir Vasilich. Here he is right in the middle. Here we have uh, colleagues and students 
in, Mar in uh, Moscow. You may recognize this young fellow. This is Alexei Evgenievich Chichibabin, the pyridine chemist. Here you have Zelensky. Zelensky didn't like Markovnikov. Markovnikov didn't like Zelensky. Markovnikov thought he was a weasel. I think Markovnikov was correct. Here's Lev Alexandrovich Chugayev, the guy who gave us dimethylglyoxine for the analysis of nickel and the Chugayev reaction. This is Rifomatsky. No, not that one. It's his brother, Alexander. And this fellow here, picking the wax out of his ears, I assume, is Nikolai Kizner. And so you can see, uh, with the exception of these two, these are Markovnikov's students. So now we'll pull that back over, go to the next one. So here we have a very young Markovnikov. He was born on Christmas Day, Western Christmas Day. Now note that this December 25th is the Roman Christmas. It's not the Orthodox Christmas. And he was actually Russian Orthodox. But he was born in a little village to an ancient noble family. Uh, his father was a lieutenant in the Believsky Jaeger Regiment. And his mother is almost invisible. We have no idea very much about her at all. But when Markovnikov was three years old, his father retired from the military with the rank of staff captain and moved the family to Knyaginina, which is near Nizhny Novgorod, where his wife had a small estate. Um, there, he got his earliest education from the village priest and the village deacon, who both taught him to read. Now, the minute he learned to read, he became a voracious reader, but very eclectic. He read stories about heroes from Russian history. He read fantasy novels. And uh, he even read his father's military manuals when he ran out of uh, other things to read. His father encouraged him to learn French and German. And so by the time he could re by the time he entered the uh, Alexander II Nobles Institute, which was basically the nobles equivalent of a gymnasium, he could already read and write both French and German. <clears throat> uh, why don't I go forward? So here we have the Nobles Institute. He entered the Nobles Institute in 1846 and graduated in 1856. He was immediately enrolled at Kazan University uh, as a student in chemical science. As a noble, he did not have to sit the entrance examinations. So he got a, an automatic free pass straight into the university, having graduated from the, the Nobles Institute. Now, cameralism was basically an economic theory that was designed to uh, educate bureaucrats to run a centralized economy. Um, the reason it was resurrected in Russia, it had been a big thing in Russia in the 1820s, but in the 1850s and 60s, it was resurrected because of Russia's humiliating loss in the Crimea. Um, and so they, the Russians viewed this as a way to get technologically competent bureaucrats to run the centralized economy that they knew they needed. Now, students in cameral science had a rather different uh, approach. Most of these students were gonna become government bureaucrats or government functionaries. And so they had to take classes in both law and in science and technology. In the law, you can see the, the uh, courses there, the basically history, politics, economics, uh, and obviously law. Science and technology. Technology was a big favorite for those who were going to go into government. Uh, mechanics, chemistry, physics, zoology, mineralogy, um, agriculture, and so on. Now, the, the fellow on the left-hand side here is Modest Yakovlevich Kitari. And Kitari uh, was the professor of chemical technology. And Markovnikov actually rather enjoyed hearing some of his lectures. So he decided to study technology as his scientific focus. The problem is 
Markovnikov entered Kazan in September of 1856. Kitari left for Moscow in January 1857, which meant that Markovnikov was not going to be able to do his scientific work in technology. And so he decided, well, there was nothing else really that turned him on much. So he just waited a couple of years before he, he basically was forced to do the science. Sort of like some pre-meds I've known in my uh, career who take organic chemistry only when it's absolutely no other option. <coughs> so for two years, he was just a student there. And then along came this fellow. This is Alexander Mikhailovich Butlerov. Butlerov, a resonance man. And um, he returned from his Komendorovka in Western Europe, where he had spent time in Paris with Wurtz um, in 1859. And for the 1859-60 academic year, he taught the organic chemistry course to the fourth years, that is seniors. Markovnikov took organic chemistry with Butlerov and immediately fell under his spell. With Butlerov's permission, Markovnikov actually took his uh, personal copy of the lecture notes he had taken, had them transcribed by a calligrapher, and then lithographed. Um, the two men became extremely close friends. Uh, Markovnikov was a frequent and popular visitor to the Butlerov house. So now, what's in the name? Here we have those lecture notes. Now, I know you can't read it. Don't worry about it. The, the title is Organic Chemistry Compiled from the Lectures of Ordinary Professor A.M. Butlerov by student V. Markovnikov. But if you look, you can see that the, uh, the name is spelled with an O. Let's see. I've got this, this window with everybody in it on the left, so I've got to figure out a way to move you. Oh, well, it's spelled Morkovnikov. Now, the emphasis in that name is on the kov, right? And in Russian, if you have an O that is in the syllable immediately preceding the stressed syllable of a word, it's pronounced as A. So, Morkovnikov is actually pronounced Markovnikov. So in 1870, he actually started using the A. And so you can see here, this is Markovnikov's rule in the uh, original Russian from 1869. And here is the uh, paper in the Annalen in 1870 with the same material in it. That's interesting. That's why. Sorry. Did I get a question or not? No? Okay. Well, we will continue. <coughs> um, once he had gotten his diploma, he began his postgraduate research, his post diploma research. He got the diploma in June of 1860, and Butlerov decided he needed to be retained for training into the uh, professoriate. Here in the top left-hand corner, we have his candidate dissertation. This is 44 pages of handwritten Russian, fortunately written by a calligrapher, so it could be read. If it had been written by Markovnikov himself, it would be totally illegible. The title, Aldehydes and Their Relationships to Alcohols and Ketones. The bottom left here, we have his Magister Himi, his master's dissertation. Um, on the isomerism of organic compounds. And this is a major work in structural theory of organic chemistry, but it also um, broaches at least the beginnings of what would become Markovnikov's rule. Here, his doctoral dissertation, Materials on the Question of the Mutual Influence of Atoms in Chemical Compounds. Um, Greber had asked uh, Markovnikov when he was on his Komenderovka in Western Europe, why is the chlorine in acetyl chloride so different from the chlorine 
in ethyl chloride. And that set Markovnikov thinking. <coughs> so he took a Komenderovka, he went to Western Europe and he spent uh, 1866 with Kolbe in Leipzig. Interestingly, Markovnikov, older than Zaitsev, actually followed Zaitsev into Kolbe's laboratory. Markovnikov was a disciple of Butlerov, who by then had, am I running out of time? <laughs> You're okay. No, I'm not. I've got to, got to move on here. Um, Markovnikov was Butlerov's absolute disciple, and therefore he was really inculcated with uh, um, Butlerov's idea of chemical structure. And Kolbe was, of course, chemical structure theory's most ardent opponent. So what most people don't realize is that uh, Kolbe was a vitriolic opponent. But when you look closely at his theory and at Butlerov's theory, they're basically the same thing. <coughs> Still, um, despite their occasional scientific differences, Markovnikov both liked and very much respected Kolbe. So now he's come back to Kazan. Um, on the way back, he stopped at the, is that the sixth? Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. The 41st meeting of German scientists and uh, 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 physicians in Frankfurt in September 1867. Before he got back to Kazan, he was a docent. In 1869, whoops, let's go back one. Can I go back one? Yes. In 1869, he was promoted to extraordinary professor. And in March, the following year, ordinary, full professor. I think there are many assistant professors in the US who would like to be an assistant professor in 1867, an associate professor in 1869, and a full professor in 1870. Uh, we don't do that anymore. He did resign from uh, Kazan in December 1871. Here's, Marko uh, here's Markovnikov, and these others. Uh, here is Lesgaft, who was the reason for the resignation. But these are all full professors in the sciences, mathematics, physics, uh, physiology, hygiene. <coughs> well, he was out of a job for exactly two weeks, and then he was hired as professor of chemistry by Novorossiysk University. Uh, this is in Odessa, which is now in the Ukraine. This entire wing of the building was the physics and chemistry wing. The labs were all brand spanking new. But in 1873, <coughs> he accepted the call to Moscow University. And there he wound up reviving the moribund organic chemistry program. Uh, if you look at this, see this room here and the room just behind it? That's the chemistry laboratories of Moscow when he arrived. So he went from this palatial and brand new facility to two little rooms. Um, nevertheless, he, uh, uh, he did revive the organic chemistry program. While he was there, he became a founder of petrochemistry in Russia. But in 1893, his enemies used one of the arcane rules of the university statute to uh, forcibly retire him from his position. Um, he was succeeded by his bete noir, if you will, uh, Nikolai Dmitrievich Zelensky. But he did remain as an honored professor until his death in 1904. <coughs> and so here you have it, Markovnikov's rule. You can read either side, they, they're saying the same thing. But what Markovnikov is basically saying here is, on the other hand, I also said that in reverse, 
that is reactions with combination of unsaturated hydrocarbons that are not symmetrically constructed with elements of water or hydrohalic acid. The subsequent distribution is such that the hydroxyl or halogen is always attached to the least hydrogenated carbon. This is exactly the reverse wording of what we now teach in our undergraduate courses. What's interesting is when you look at something like hydroboration, hydroboration fits this definition perfectly because boron is less electronegative than hydrogen. But of course, uh, Frank Whitmore came in with his proton, with his mechanistic studies, saw that the proton adds first, and then H.C. Brown ignored the fact that it's not H plus that adds in hydroboration, and so we get anti-Markovnikov addition. Now, what kind of influence did he have? Well, here are some people who did major work in organic chemistry that uh, we have uh, to thank Markovnikov for. Uh, over here, we have Gavril Gavrilich Gustafsson, who did a lot of work with Lewis acids and uh, uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, here we have Mikhail Ivanich Konovalov, who gave us the Konovalov nitration of alkanes. Here, Nikolai Yakovlevich Demyanov, the Demyanov rearrangement of alcohols of cyclopropyl carbonyl and cyclobutanol, and back and forth, and the uh, rearrangement with the amines, diazotized amines. Here we have Nikolai Kishner who was a Markovnikov student. And here, uh, I didn't ever, I didn't realize his mustache was really that good uh, when he was young. But here we have Alexei Yevgenyich Chichibabin. <coughs> so that brings us to number two, Alexander Mikhailovich Zaitsev. This guy knows Russian. Sorry? I'm glad this guy knows Russian because I couldn't pronounce these names if it killed me. <laughs> 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 ah. Well, Russian is easy to pronounce. It's not a problem, you know. <laughs> now, the name Zaitsev has a long association or a major association with Kazan because Alexander Mikhailovich and his brothers, Konstantin Mikhailovich, Mikhail Mikhailovich, and Alexei Mikhailovich, and his nephew, Mikhail Mikhailovich Jr., were all trained as chemists and all obtained graduate degrees, uh, at least the Magister Chimi, from Kazan University. So we have the Zaitsev dynasty here at Kazan. So Alexander Mikhailovich, born in 1841, his father, Mikhail Savich Zaitsev, was a respected member of the guilds and he uh, uh, was particularly important in the selling of tea and sugar. His first wife, whom we only know by her initials NN, died somewhere around 1836. <clears throat> she had two sons. The chemists are all from his second wife. Now, his second wife was uh, Natalia uh, Vasilyevna Yapunova. She was the sister of the professor of astronomy at uh, Kazan, Mikhail Vasilich Lyapunov. Um, and so she had three children, four children. And when Zaitsev was six, she died of cholera. So now we've got uh, Zaitsev's father on wife number two. He eventually married wife number three. But any talk on Russia would not be complete without a look at a Russian cathedral. Here we have a cathedral. This is the uh, uh, St. Peter's and Paul, uh, St. Peter and Paul Cathedral in Kazan. Um, the Zaitsev family had lived in Kazan since Ivan IV, uh, Ivan the Terrible, had conquered it um, in the 15th century. His Zaitsev's grandfather, Savas Stepanich, uh, was a merchant and he was an elder of this particular cathedral. The cathedral had been destroyed by fire in 1815 and Savas Stepanich Zaitsev was rich enough 
that he actually was able to pay for rebuilding the cathedral in the 1824 to 1825 time period. And he oversaw it. So here, if you go to Kazan, you can go into this cathedral. You can actually take photographs inside the cathedral, which is unusual in Russia. But you're looking at the Zaitsev family legacy to the religious life. <clears throat> now, Alexander Mikhailovich was at loggerheads with his father. His father was determined that Alexander and Konstantin and Mikhail, in fact, all his sons, were going to follow him into the guilds. Zaitsev did not want a career in the guilds as a trader. So he talked to his uncle, the astronomer Lyapunov, and uh, his uncle basically convinced his father that the kids at least ought to receive a good education, at least through high school. And his father said, all right. And so uh, Zaitsev entered the gymnasium, graduating what today we would call pre-law. Now, he wasn't a nobleman, so he had to actually pass the entrance examination to get into the university, and that required two subjects that the gymnasium was not very good with. Mathematics, which was not taught well, and Latin, which was not taught at all. And so it was his uncle and his aunts who taught him the math and the Latin he'd need to enter the university. In 1858, um, following his uh, brother Constantine, he entered the university uh, as a cameralist. Again, his father put his foot down. He's either going to go and become a bureaucrat or a, a, a educated merchant, or he's not going to university at all. Okay. Now, Zaitsev was very different from Markovnikov in that Zaitsev was headstrong as a young man. Now, his father had planned that he was going to enter the guilds when he graduated, but Mikhail Savich died about two months before Zaitsev's graduation in 1862. And so what Zaitsev did was he, uh, he liquidated his inheritance, and then he followed his older brother, Konstantin, who had gone to Kolba's lab in Marburg, but had done so the traditional way, he got his candidate degree and then gone. <coughs> Zaitsev didn't have a candidate degree. <coughs> now, did he do any chemistry? It's, you've got to have at least some chemistry in, a, in a, a talk about organic chemists, right? So he spent four semesters with Marburg, and here's the chemistry that he put out at the time. So the first was studies beginning with salicylic acid and ending up with diamino salicylic acid. Uh, this uh, hydriodide salt is quite uh, stable. But when he uh, basified it to get the free base, he wound up with a dark brown material from which he couldn't recover anything useful. The other thing he did is down here. He discovered the sulfoxides. He actually discovered the sulfoxides. And he also discovered the sulfonium salts. E.J. Corey made a career out of sulfoxides and sulfonium salts in the 1970s. <coughs> so now, he knew he couldn't come back to a salaried position without a candidate degree. So what he did was he sent back a, a dissertation, 75 pages handwritten, the theoretical views of Culver on the rational constitution of organic compounds and their relationship with inorganic ones. He submitted this to Butlerov. These are the ideas of structural theory's most ardent opponent to its most ardent proponent. He submitted in 1863, and you can guess that it didn't go well. Yeah? And so Butlerov, in fact, it sent him, made him apoplectic. He was ruthless in dissecting it. Um, Butlerov was usually very equanimous. He was, a, he was a nice guy. But the comments he's got here are, are very biting, truly acerbic. He criticized Zaitsev's logic 
without mercy. And he went so far as to criticize Zaitsev's Russian translations of Colbert's terminology. At one point, he's got a poor rendering of the German. Well, Zaitsev knew that he had screwed up. He also knew that he needed a degree of candidate to hold a salaried position back in Russia. And so the title, I think, is pretty uh, indicative. Oops, I'm broke. How do I get home? Bordlerov will help, I hope. He needed the candidate. He didn't have it. But Butlerov had followed his work in Germany and France and saw in him a first-rate synthetic organic chemist. <clears throat> and so he urged Zaitsev to write up the work that he had written in Paris on the uh, uh, salicylic acid work uh, as a candidate dissertation. Zaitsev did this, and the year before he came back to Kazan, he submitted a new dissertation, and this time he got the degree. Now, that should have solved all the problems, right? But it didn't, because he had the wrong degree. <laughs> His candidate degree was in cameral science. The Magister Chimie degree was awarded in the physics mathematics faculty. His candidate degree did not qualify him for admission to the graduate program in chemistry. So what do you do? Well, um, Zaitsev knew whom and what to kiss and when. And so he started working for Butlerov as a private person. In other words, for free. The only thing was that he uh, had it that Butlerov would not require him to pay the fees at a private, like a private docent would normally get. After a while, Butlerov did get him an appointment as assistant in the agronomy laboratory, but we've still got the problem. His candidate degree is in cameral science, and he has to have one in the physics and mathematical sciences. So how could he do it? Well, it turns out the university regulations provided a way for him to get into the graduate program uh, by petition. All he had to do was to earn a research-based doctoral degree from a foreign university, like a PhD. So what did he do? Well, he wrote up his work on the sulfoxides and sulfonium salts that he'd done with uh, Kolbe in Marburg, and he sent it to Leipzig, to Kolbe in Leipzig. And thanks to Kolbe's influence, he got the PhD there without ever setting foot on the campus or being enrolled on the campus for a second. After this more stringent requirements, especially with regard to uh, residents on campus, uh, came to be required at German universities for the PhD. <laughs> now, he's got two graduate degrees now. He was permitted his uh, petition to enter for the Magister Chimie degree uh, was granted. And in uh, 1867, he submitted, uh, I've got to get you folks out of my way for a minute. Um, on uh, the reactions of nitric acid with divalent sulfur compounds and on a new class of organic sulfur compounds obtained from this reaction. This is the synthesis of sulfoxides by nitric acid oxidation of sulfides. The examiners of this Magister Chimie dissertation were Butlerov and Markovnikov. Now, note 1867, Butlerov is still professor and uh, uh, the, the professor at Kazan. No problems. In 1870, two years after Butlerov had left Kazan, uh, Zaitsev submitted uh, this dissertation over here. I'm sure you've all been reading the title avidly, but for those who, who want uh, a translation, uh, a new way to convert fatty acids to their corresponding alcohols. It's a two-parter. The second part, normal butyl, butyl alcohol, propyl carbonyl, and its conversion to secondary butyl alcohol, or methyl ethyl carbonyl. Um, the first half was on the reduction of acid chlorides with sodium amalgam buffered in acetic acid, in ether, and buffered with acetic acid. The second one was simply 
taking uh, uh, primary butyl alcohol, treat it with HI, you get one iodobutane because the reaction with iodide is much, the SN2 reaction with iodide is much faster than any SN1 reaction. So there's no rearrangement. And then he did the elimination, got one butene, and then added water, uh, added water to it, and we get secondary butyl alcohol. Now, Bortlerov was no longer at Kazan. Markovnikov wasn't. Markovnikov was now associate professor, extraordinary professor. Markovnikov's ass assessment was really condescending and superficially positive, but sort of in the way that we would write, um, Dear Dr. Egolf, um, I cannot recommend Dr. Lewis too highly to you. You'll be lucky to get him to work for you. Sounds pretty good, right? Or is it, dear Dr. Egolf, I can't recommend Dr. Lewis too highly to you. You'll be lucky to get him to work for you, <laughs> right? Which is it? And that's exactly what uh, Markovnikov was trying to do. In any case, his final sentences was basically a grudging admission that yes, Zaitsev had met the required standard. So here we have a timeline and there's some people here we need to note. Here is Butlerov, here is Zaitsev. This is Glinsky, Grigory Glinsky. And here we have Alexander Nikiforovich Popov. Um, what happened is in 1868, Butlerov left to take up a professorship at St. Petersburg. 1869, Markovnikov was appointed extraordinary professor. And they were looking for a, uh, uh, a colleague for him. And they looked very hard at Popov. The problem is that Popov promptly took a position at Warsaw University. So Zaitsev ended up being appointed docent. The next year, Markovnikov has become ordinary professor. Zaitsev has become associate professor. And the following year, 1871, Zaitsev was promoted to full professor as well. So things moved quickly in, in Kazan at the time. <clears throat> now, here we have, this is, uh, uh, Zaitsev lecturing in the Butlerov Auditorium. I've actually stood right there and given a lecture. It's lots of fun. And it looks the same there, except they don't have this big old water casket. Now, it wasn't long before Markovnikov left for uh, Novorossiysk. And so this left Zaitsev with responsibility for basically teaching every chemistry course and running the lab. It was untenable and he needed a new professorial colleague and the one chosen was Glinsky. Glinsky had taken his degree under Konstantin Zaitsev, Zaitsev's older brother. But it didn't take long to find out that Glinsky wasn't up to the job. And so poor Zaitsev was no better off than he was before Glinsky was hired. <clears throat> so here we have Zaitsev's rule. And you can see in this that uh, Markovnikov had struck a nerve because here we've got Markovnikov has come to the conclusion, well, you, you can probably read it faster than I can read it, right? I've got to get, ah, there we go. Oh, pardon me. I'll take you back and again and again and again and again. <laughs> What am I doing? I'm going the wrong way. Uh, 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 there we are. Sorry, folks. So anyway, Markovnikov has come to the view that the least hydrogenated atom of carbon, even if it is in the same proximity with other more hydrogenated carbon atoms, is least able to remove hydrogen. This is exactly the opposite of what Zaitsev found. Zaitsev then says, but it seemed to me that iodine in most cases where several carbon atoms hydrogenated to different degrees are in the same conditions in the vicinity of the carbon atom uh, 
bonded uh, iodine or coupled with iodine would take the hydrogen of the least hydrogenated carbon atom out of the compound. In other words, Zaitsev is saying, I think you get the most substituted alkene. Markovnikov is saying, I think you get the least substituted. We know who was right. <clears throat> now, his career lasted 40 years. He had celebrated his 40th Jubilee in 1909. He uh, retired only very shortly before his death, and he was deathly ill, which is why he retired at all. But here we see uh, some of the mementos presented to him by his students and former students. In 1885, he was elected a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, or as it was at the time, the Imperial Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he was the chair of the chemistry division of the Russian Physical Chemical Society in 1904, and a year later he became the president of the society. Oh, good. Now, Zaitsev's influence? Yeah, he influenced some people too. Here is Yegor Yegorovich Wagner. He of the Wagner-Mervine rearrangement and permanganate oxidation, which in Russia they call the Wagner oxidation. This is the other Rifomatsky, Sergei Nikolaevich Rifomatsky. He gave us the Rifomatsky reaction. And then the bottom one there is Alexander Yermin Geldovich Arbuzov. I love that middle name there. Um, and he gave us the Arbuzov rearrangement. Officially, they call it the Michaelis Arbuzov rearrangement. But if you read what Michaelis did and you read how much more Arbuzov did, uh, it really ought to be the Arbuzov Michaelis if you're going to go that way. Now we get to the crux, the feud. Why did they hate each other's guts? Well, let's look at our protagonists for a minute. All right. So Markovnikov was Butlerov's close friend and his most devoted disciple. Markovnikov was himself a brilliant theoretician. Now, in contrast to this, Zaitsev was not a close disciple of Butlerov. And his disastrous first uh, candidate dissertation showed that he was never going to be a theoretician either. But Take a look at what he did, and I think he had the best pair of hands in the 19th century as an experimental organic chemist. He discovered, prepared, and proved the structures of sulfoxides and sulfonium salts. His reduction of acid chlorides with sodium amalgam was, for at least a while, the method of choice for reducing carboxylic acids to primary alcohols. <laughs> the zeitzef wagner synthesis of alcohols is alkyl zinc halides and aldehydes or ketones. The uh, Zaitsev and Wagner were able to get this to work really well. A Frenchman had trouble with it and so he switched the zinc to magnesium. His name was Victor Grignard. Uh, Grignard was not, in my opinion, as good an experimentalist as Zaitsev. And Zaitsev also studied the permanganate oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids. But the interesting thing here is that this reaction, the Zaitsev Wagner synthesis of alcohols, was resurrected by Ryoji Noyori, who won the Nobel Prize for his asymmetric addition of alkyl zinc reagents to aldehydes and ketones. <laughs> now, Let's go back to Markovnikov for a minute. He really uh, took it very badly, the way that Butlerov's um, version of structural theory of organic chemistry was uh, basically dissed by Western organic chemists. He was also a fighter against what he saw as abuse of authority. Uh, this, of course, made him an attractive target for administrative retribution. <laughs> he also had some weird ideas, like women ought to be allowed to get a university education, students ought to be allowed to congregate in groups of more than three. Yeah. And so, 
Yeah, these were very counter uh, culture type ideas. Zaitsev was headstrong when he was young, but he was a master of figuring out how he could work things to his advantage. He was a very slick little barrack room lawyer. <clears throat> the one thing he did do was he inspired fanatic loyalty in his students. <clears throat> so why the few? Where did it come from? In my view, and this is strictly my view, uh, I think Markovnikov saw Zaitsev as an apostate who had dismissed Butlerov's theory in his ill-conceived candidate dissertation from Marburg. I think Markovnikov saw that as a slap in the face to his revered Butlerov. Uh, Markovnikov was fanatically devoted to Butlerov and to Russia. And so seeing this uh, dissertation, this candidate dissertation, as a slap in the face to both, I don't think that helped uh, Zaitsev with Butlerov at all. Um, the next thing is that Markovnikov viewed theory, not experiment, as the highest form of chemistry. Experiment was the handmaiden whose job it was to provide evidence for the theory. And perhaps worst of all, Markovnikov never attempted to hide his disdain for Zaitsev and Zaitsev's work. Markovnikov's not the only one to blame. Zaitsev may also have played a part. Um, his strengths were in the laboratory. Um, his organo-zinc synthesis really did mark him as a synthetic chemist of the first water. As I say, I think that we got the Grignard reaction because Grignard couldn't get chemistry that Zaitsev had been getting to go all along. Um, the other thing is that Markovnikov's continuous disdain, and remember Markovnikov was noble, Zaitsev was not, so it's probably class warfare here as well. But I think what this did was, uh, if there had been a tendency to an inferiority complex, I think Markovnikov drove him, drove him over the edge. <clears throat> I think Zaitsev probably viewed Markovnikov, the frequent visitor to Butlerov, uh, and by the way, Butlerov also, was a nobleman with an estate. And so he may have viewed Markovnikov as a teacher's pet. And yeah, you know, even Butlerov's signs of favor couldn't overcome this. <clears throat> and uh, a friend in Kazan suggested to me that uh, my interpretation a decade ago, that Zaitsev's willingness to allow Wagner to go to St. Petersburg and study with Butlerov was not altruistic at all, but that instead Zaitsev was afraid of Wagner, the really bright theoretician. So again, it's this theory versus experiment thing. So there you have it. Um, I don't know if I've raised questions. I hope I have. Um, and with that, thank you for your attention. Spasiba za vnimanje. Thank you very much, Dave. That was great. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure uh, David will take some questions if anybody has any. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There are 30 of you there. Somebody must have a question. <laughs> David, uh, end your slideshow so people can right see there. you. Now. Oh, there we are. There oh. we go. That better? <laughs> David, uh, you mentioned at the, uh, at, or before you were comparing them, that uh, when Zaitsev was the full professor, he was responsible for, for teaching everything. Did, didn't, uh, didn't they have... Um, assistance, uh, you know, like like they did in Paris and and um, and London. Lots of uh, they didn't uh, have a lot at Kazan. They did not have a lot. Uh, Remember, uh, this is 1871. Zaitsev has only just been promoted to professor, 
He does not have a large research group at all. And so consequently, he, well, he was lecturing in general chemistry. He was lecturing in organic chemistry. Um, he was almost certainly doing lectures in analytical and inorganic chemistry, uh, if not one semester than the other. And he had the responsibility for running the lab, which means getting the, uh, <coughs> getting the lab ready for the experiments, getting the material there and the, the whole issue. And uh, think about this, if you've got four lectures and five labs and you're responsible for getting everything for all of them, yeah, when do you sleep? <coughs> and, yeah, they, they, and, and this was uh, this was one of the centers, I mean, the center of Russian organic chem uh, Russian organic chemistry at the time, right? But it, it's also interesting. This was a nexus, if you will, because prior to 1871, you had Butlerov, you'd had Zinian, you'd had Klaus, uh, you had Markovnikov. They were all there along with Zaitsev. So you, you really had the creme de la creme, right? Then by 1871, Butlerov's gone, Zinian's gone, Klaus is gone, Markovnikov is gone. And you've got now everything's dumped on Zaitsev and it took him a while, I think, to get going. But in turn, he produced Wagner, who probably was the most brilliant mind of his era. Um, Rifomatsky, the man who came up with the only synthesis of beta hydroxycarbonyl compounds that was not killed by the strong lithium amide bases. Um, and then you've got Arbuzov, of course, who then built a, an organophosphorus empire at Kazan. So there was a, there was sort of a hiatus while Zaitsev got on his feet. Does that make sense? I still like Kazan, it's a wonderful city. <laughs> Anyone? Hi, Dr. Lewis. Yo. Hi, very interesting talk. I'm very glad that I sat in. Um, I had one question. I was very curious how you did all the research for this. Like, it's, you obviously, you know, put a lot of research into it. I was wondering where you found all, all of uh, everything out. Was it mostly experience from your career or did you use the internet and library? You know, I was just curious. Uh, the short thing is all of the above, okay? Uh, I started looking at things like this back when the internet was not thought of. So we used uh, really quaint objects. They called them books. And they're kept in uh, really quaint buildings called libraries. <laughs> um, I've since discovered that I, I do a lot of the stuff, a lot of my hunting online now. But uh, if you want to get information on the Russians, you do your hunt in Russian. Uh, if you Google Markovnikov, you get a paragraph like so, right? You just write out Markovnikov in English. If you Google Markovnikov in Russian, you get that, right? A lot, right. a lot of references to the original literature that never show up in the, uh, the English language things. So I've learned that when you're chasing down dead Russians, look for them in Russian. <laughs> oh, Thank you I, very much. I should have, I should have thrown up. I've got pictures of both their graves. I should have put them up, shouldn't I? <laughs> the, the, the last, but well, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's interesting to find out that those guys that you learned about actually were human beings. Yeah, it is. <laughs> With foibles. <clears throat> okay let's all thank uh david we can use that uh special button with uh hand clapping and reactions <laughs> <laughs> thank you roger <laughs>